Did you realize that the law was not in effect while Jesus was here on this earth? And it hasn't been in effect since then, except that some people don't know that. Today, I've got some good news to share with you, so stay tuned for the Gospel Truth. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that emphasizes God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Monday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today, I am continuing a series talking about the true nature of God. This is the beginning of our fourth week on that subject. Now, I believe that today, or this week, not today, but this week will be the end of my teaching on this. And I tell you, I've covered a lot of material. There's no way I can go back over it. But I do have a brand new teaching on this. Actually, it's the same teaching, but it's new and improved. It's expanded. It went from three teachings to five teachings. And I believe that it's going to be uh, even better than my old series on the true nature of God. So please take advantage of that offer at the end of our program today. Now, I was showing that a lot of the misconception about what God is like actually came from the Old Testament law. And I've used a lot of things to show this, that the law wasn't given to help break the dominion of sin over us, but it was to increase the dominion of sin over us. Now that sounds contrary. If you missed any of this teaching, you need to go back because I, that's an exact, um, it's a paraphrase, but it's the exact point that Scripture is making that the law gave sin occasion against us. It strengthened sin. It made sin come alive on the inside of us. So why did God give the law? Well, I showed from Romans 5.13 that for the first 2,000 years after the fall of Adam and Eve, that God basically didn't impute man's sins unto them. He was merciful. And I showed this in his dealings with uh, <coughs> Cain and Abel, with Abraham with Noah, with uh, Israel or Jacob. And I showed you that how if those people would have lived under the Old Testament law, they would have all been stoned to death, put to death for the things that they did. And yet God granted them mercy. As a matter of fact, the very first murderer on the face of the earth, God gave him mercy instead of judgment. He actually protected Cain and says, if anybody kills Cain because he killed his brother Abel, I'll avenge his death sevenfold. In contrast to this, the very first person that violated the law was in Numbers chapter 15, and there the Lord said, stone this man to death. And all he did was pick up, pick up some sticks so that he could make a fire and cook him some food. And God said, put him to death because he broke the Sabbath. There is a difference in the way God dealt with people under the law and the way he dealt with people under grace. So why did God give this harshness? If this isn't really his true nature and character, then why did God give the law? Well, I'm glad you asked. And here is the reason. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 4. And we see where God protected the first murderer on the face of the earth, Cain. And instead of killing him, he says if anybody tries to kill Cain in a you know, punish him for what he did to his brother Abel. I'll avenge Cain sevenfold. Well, look what happened later in this same chapter. In verse 23, it says, And Lamech, now Lamech was Cain's great, great, great grandson. And so Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech. Hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. Now the problem that with this thinking here is God didn't say this. Lamech assumed some things. Lamech assumed that if Cain got by with murder, <clears throat> then I'm going to get by with murder because my murder was more justified. You know, this terminology here in the King James, he says, I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. It's kind of wordy and it... And it's vague, but if you study this out, what it's saying is he killed a man in self-defense. And he basically said Cain's murder was not self-defense. It was just premeditated murder. And if Cain got by with murder, then I'm going to get by with murder because mine was self-defense. And he made the classic mistake. It says, but they comparing themselves among themselves and measuring themselves by themselves are not wise. And that's a classic mistake that people make. They think, well, if the hypocrites down there at church make it, I'm going to make it. 
and so they don't go to church. The only thing wrong with that reasoning is the hypocrites at church aren't going to make it. They aren't your standard that you're supposed to be comparing yourself against. We're supposed to measure ourselves up against Jesus, and compared to Jesus, all of us have sinned and come short of that standard. But see, people make this mistake constantly. They say, well, this person's a politician, a movie star, or whatever, and they still get an Academy Award. They still get elected to office, and they're a homosexual. And they didn't drop over dead, and they have fame, and they have money and wealth. And you know what? Maybe homosexuality isn't so bad. See, that, that thing is happening multiplied times over every single day. People are looking at somebody and because they get by, it looks like from our perspective, they are getting by with their sin. We think that sin may not be so bad. But see, we, aren't, we don't have the perspective of seeing the end result of this thing. God is going to set all of this straight. There is coming a, ju a judgment day where every person who hasn't accepted Jesus is going to be judged and all of their sins are going to be punished. And we haven't seen the end result of all of that yet. So from our limited perspective, sometimes it looks like, well, this person got by with sin, so you know what? Maybe I can get by with sin. See, people were taking God's lack of punishment upon sin as his approval of their sin. That's the way that Lamech interpreted God's actions towards Cain. Cain had killed his brother Abel, and instead of God killing him, God actually put a mark upon him and protected Cain. And so Lamech just assumed that he got by with murder, I'm going to get by with murder, and all of a sudden people begin to lose their moral compass. They begin to think, murder's not that bad. Cain lived, Lamech lived. You know what? You can go out and kill people if you want to. You can have multiple wives. You can live in immorality. You can do this. People were prospering. People were going on. They were living to be 900 years old, and God wasn't judging them. And so people took God's lack of judgment upon sin as approval for sin. It wasn't that way at all. God never has approved of our sin. Sin grieves God. And I can guarantee you that God was grieved with seeing what was going on in the earth. It says this in um, Genesis chapter 6, that the Lord saw the sin that was upon the earth and that the imagination of man's heart was only evil continually, and it grieved the Lord at his heart, and it made God repent that he had ever created man on the earth. You know, that passage of Scripture, every time I read that, boy, that just really touches me. It, it grieves me that not only myself, but the whole human race has disappointed God so much that there was a time that he wished he'd have never made man. Well, that's a strong statement. Now, see, sin was affecting God. Sin was a transgression against God. But because of God's great love for mankind, he wasn't venting his wrath on man for the first 2,000 years. Now, that's a general statement. There were some exceptions, but generally speaking, God didn't vent his wrath on mankind for the first 2,000 years. That's what Romans 5.13 says. And so God was offended by sin, but he wasn't judging us for our sin. He wasn't imputing man's trespasses unto them. So why did he ever give the law? Because people took his lack of punishment upon sin as acceptance of or approval of sin. And so therefore, they were just letting sin run rampant. And sin began to grow and multiply because there wasn't this wrath and judgment of God that put fear in people. And sin was multiplying and escalating at such a rate that if God hadn't have done something to restrain it, there literally wouldn't have been a virgin on the face of the earth left for Jesus to have been born through. Now, some people think that's an, ex uh, an exaggeration, but I believe it's absolutely true. You know, I've gone back and I've studied archaeological historical records about Sodom and Gomorrah and the way that they lived. And I, I can't even tell you on television um, some of the things that I've read. Some of the archaeological evidence about the bestiality, the homosexuality, the immorality, the terrible things that were being done. I mean, it was beyond our conception. As a matter of fact, you can look at it this way. Jesus said that in the end times, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. And what he's talking about is, 
that in the days right before Jesus comes back, the world is once again going to be corrupt and vile the way that it was during the days of Noah. Now stop and think. The days of Noah, it was 1,656 years after the fall of Adam when the flood came. So in 1,656 years, the human race de-evolved, degraded to the place that God wiped out all of the creation except for, for eight people and the animals that were on Noah's Ark. And yet, it's been approximately 4,000 plus years since that time, and we are just now beginning to approach back to the levels of ungodliness and immorality that the human race de-evolved into in the first 1,656 years. How can you account for that? Well, a lot of it comes from the fact that the law was introduced and it revealed God's wrath and punishment upon sin and it has been a prohibitor or a limiter of sin on the earth. Now, it may have stopped the amount of sin, but the sin that people have committed begin to multiply and escalate the damage of it, the condemnation, the guilt, the sense of worthiness, driving us away from God. Those are some of the negative side effects of this wrath of God. It did limit the amount of sin, but the sin that was committed began to have much more damaging effect once God gave the law. And that's the reason that he was hesitant to give it for nearly 2,000 years because he didn't want to release these negative side effects of sin, but it had to be done. So I've been sharing that one of the reasons God gave the Old Testament law and began to show his wrath and displeasure and hatred towards our sin was because prior to the law, people took God's lack of punishment upon sin as approval or acceptance of sin, and they were just allowing sin to multiply at an unprecedented rate. Did you know that the lifespan of man came from up in the upper 900 years down to 120 years in approximately 1500 or 1656 years, uh, the time between the Adam uh, when he sinned and when the flood came. Adam lived to be 930 years old. Methuselah, one of his uh, children, not direct children, but uh, you know, great, great, great grandson, he lived to be 969 years old. But by the days of Noah, God said that the days of man's years shall be 120 years old. So in approximately 1,656 years, the lifespan of men had dropped from the upper 900s down to 120. And it would have dropped even more. Matter of fact, Moses is the one who wrote uh, Psalms chapter 90. Moses is the one who wrote that the days of a man's life are three score years and ten. That wasn't a maximum. That was a minimum. And you can prove that because Moses himself lived to be 120 years old, the guy who wrote that. God wasn't saying that I'm only going to let you live 70 years. He put a minimum on our life or we would have been dying even younger than that. That is the minimum that God has allotted us. If a person dies prior to that time, Satan snuffed out our life premature. It's not guaranteed, but that is the basic, the standard that God has given mankind. So I'm using all of these things to say that, see, sin was still having an effect on the human race even though God wasn't judging it. Let me turn back over to Romans chapter 5, and I can show this to you out of the exact passage of Scripture that we've been using this week. In Romans 5.13, it says, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. But in verse 14, it says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. So in verse 13, it says, Until the law, for the nearly first 2,000 years, God wasn't imputing man's sins unto them. But then in verse 14, it says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. What is this saying? If God wasn't imputing, holding man's sins against them, then why were they dying? Well, here's the answer. Because sin had a two-fold effect. Sin was not only a transgression against God that was worthy of his judgment and punishment, but sin is also a direct inroad of Satan into our life. 
And even though God for the first 2,000 years wasn't punishing man's sins, Satan was taking advantage of man's sins. And man's lifespan was decreasing rapidly. Uh, death was ruling and dominating. And even though God, it's what I call the vertical and the horizontal effect, even though the wrath of God, this vertical effect, wasn't taking place upon sin, God wasn't punishing man's sins as a whole. Satan, this horizontal effect of sin, was, was definitely in operation. Satan was taking advantage of our sins. The Bible says in Romans 6.16, 6, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are, to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Don't you know that if you yield yourself to sin, you become the servant to the author of that sin, the devil? That's what he's saying. So even though God wasn't punishing man's sins, sin was still destroying the human race. And if God hadn't have placed a limit upon sin, the human race would have become so corrupt, so defiled, that there wouldn't have been a virgin left for Jesus to have been born through. And so God had to place a restraint upon sin. This wasn't his true nature. God didn't want to impute our sins unto us. When Jesus came and began to start representing God completely and was able to bring in the full plan of God into manifestation, once again, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing men's trespasses unto them. That's 2 Corinthians 5.19. And so that was God's original plan. But prior to the time that Jesus came, sin was beginning to in, uh, you know, uh, infect the human race to such a degree that God's plan couldn't have been fulfilled if he hadn't have done something to purge the human race of sin and limit the spread of sin in people. And so that's the reason that God bring the, brought the law. It wasn't his first choice. He could have communicated the law to Adam and Eve when they were still in the garden. He was talking to them face to face, and that was normal in those days. When he talked to Moses face to face, 2,000 years later, that wasn't normal. That was the exception. One time when Moses was challenged by some of his critics, the Lord intervened, and the Lord said in an audible voice, if any of the rest of you, if I'm going to speak to you, I'll speak to you in a dream or in a vision, but my servant Moses isn't like that. I'll talk to him face to face. Moses was the exception in his day, but back in the day of Adam and Eve, it was normal for God to talk to them face to face. Why didn't God give Adam and Eve the Ten Commandments? Why didn't he give them all of these laws? Do you think God hadn't come up with them yet? Do you think that God hadn't decided that murder was wrong yet, that adultery was wrong yet, that lying was wrong yet, that you aren't supposed to, that you're supposed to honor your father and mother? Do you think he came up with that just 2,000 years later? Nope, God is the same. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But you know, God didn't want to vent his wrath upon mankind because it would have just destroyed us. If Adam and Eve would have known the depths of what they had done, it would have destroyed them. They couldn't have lived with themselves. God did not want to impute our sins unto us. He was wanting to impute our sins unto his Son. But the Bible says, when the fullness of time was come... Then Jesus was made of a woman and made under the law. There was a fullness of time. There was things that had to happen. That's another teaching. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into that today. But the Lord couldn't just come immediately after the fall of Adam and Eve and reconcile the human race back unto God the Father. There was nearly 4,000 years of things that had to take place before Jesus could come and bring the full plan of God in the manifestation. And the Lord's desire was to just love us and not impute our sins unto us. But people begin to get so sinful and so corrupt and given over to demonic things that sin was, was uh, multiplying at a rate that it literally would have killed the entire body before the cure would have arrived. So what God did, he began to start cutting off parts of the body that were infected, getting rid of the infection, trying to keep the, the body alive, the person alive until the cure could come. And basically that's a summary of why God gave the law. It wasn't God's first intent. If it was, he could have given it to Adam and Eve directly.
but he waited 2,000 years. And it says over in Galatians chapter 3, let me just read a few of these scriptures to you. In Galatians chapter 3, in verse 19, it says, Wherefore then serveth the law. It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And in verse 16, it says that that seed was talking about Jesus. This makes it very clear that the law was added because of our transgressions and it was only in effect until the seed should come, talking about Jesus. So the law was nearly 2,000 years after the transgression of Adam and Eve. It was only temporary until Jesus could come. You put this together with 2 Corinthians 5.19 and it shows you that the law wasn't in effect during the life of Jesus. John chapter 1 verse 17, Matthew chapter 11 verses 11 and 12, all of these show that the law was only temporary and it wasn't in effect during the time of Jesus. It ceased. Jesus began to start giving access to God under a different covenant than the Old Testament law. So go back again to Galatians 3.19. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it is ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, then verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. How clear can you get it? The law was temporary. It was given nearly 2,000 years after the fall of Adam and Eve. It was only added because sin began to multiply so much. God had to restrict the amount of sin. And it was only temporary until Christ should come. It was like a schoolmaster to lead us unto Christ. But now that Christ has come, the schoolmaster has no more effect in our life. You are not supposed to be relating to God based on the Old Testament law. You don't have to have this concept that I've got to keep all of these rules and regulations in order to have God pleased with me. That's what the Old Testament law said. But God said those things not so that you could keep all of them, but rather to show you that if this is what the standard is, if this is what God demands, I can't ever keep it. God have mercy on me, a sinner. Man, that's awesome. You know, we're out of time today. So I'm going to have to quit, but I do want to encourage you to get this brand new product I have on the true nature of God. This is going to be my last week to offer it, so please take advantage of it. And then join me again tomorrow as we continue the gospel truth.